our midst. He is and ever shall be. You're listening to Ancient Faith Radio, timeless Christianity, 24 hours a day. At Ancient Faith Ministries, we present our content with the understanding that viewpoints vary on how to apply orthodox theology to today's world. We also understand that you will eventually hear something on our platform with which you may not agree. While we strive to only present material that is in line with the teachings of the Orthodox Church, we do not necessarily endorse all of the content available on our website. Thanks for listening, and thanks for your support. The Ancient Faith for the Modern World. This is Ancient Faith Radio. Search the scriptures as Christ our God said in the This is Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. Join us for an interactive verse-by-verse study of the Bible with one of Orthodoxy's most respected biblical scholars. Study along with us and share your comments and questions by calling 855-237-2346. That's 855-237-2346. Here now is Dr. Jeannie Constantinou. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Illumine our hearts, O Master who loves mankind, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds to understand thy gospel teachings. Implant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments, that trampling down all carnal desires, we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things that are well-pleasing to thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and to thee we ascribe glory, together with thy Father who is from everlasting, and thine all holy and good, and life-giving Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Welcome to Search the Scriptures, dear brothers and sisters. Search the Scriptures live, rather. I'm Dr. Jeannie Constantino, and today's date is March 11th, 2024. This is Lesson 63 on the Gospel of Matthew. Did you think it would take so long just to get through the Gospel of Matthew? Well, it's not my fault, you know. The fault is all these wonderful fathers and their amazing statements that are inspirational and instructive, and I'm glad you're joining me for the ride tonight and every Monday night as we go through the Gospel of Matthew. We are currently in chapter 15. We're about to begin chapter 15, and this um, introduces a more of the conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees, but a lot of what he's talking about here are issues that I think we need to talk about because Lent is approaching. Lent is one week from today. It's going to be clean Monday. So today the Lord is uh, confronted by the Pharisees. Uh, Christians are accustomed to hearing about Pharisees. We've already seen them confront Jesus before. The last time that I can recall, well, it had to do with why he allowed the the, uh, the disciples to to um, to clean the grain on the Sabbath. Remember that? That's just before he got into the discussion with um, with them about John the Baptist. That was a while ago. I think that was chapter, that's chapter 11 or 12. I'm trying to remember now. But it was a while ago. And prior to that, they confronted him about healing on the Sabbath with um, the healing of the man with the withered hand. So we're accustomed to this, but let's just kind of quickly remind ourselves about the Pharisees who are they and what role did they play in Judaism? And let's begin with what the law of Moses is, because this is mentioned often. And because we are not Jewish, we hear the law. We tend to think of the Ten Commandments, especially if we hear law of Moses, we think of the Ten Commandments. But when the um, Bible refers to the law of Moses or just plain the law, it's almost never talking about the Ten Commandments. Instead, It's referring to hundreds of laws that were part of the Torah for and uh, required to be observed by the Jews. So now the Torah is not all of the Jewish scriptures. Some people just think that the Torah is the Jewish Bible, but that's only the first part. That's only the first five books. 
of the Jewish Bible. We call it, usually the Christians refer to it as the Pentateuch, the first five books. But it's the most important part of the Jewish gospel, uh, Bible and is similar to what the gospels stand for for us. The gospels are the most important part because they tell us about the life, the death, the teachings, the resurrection of the Lord. So um, similarly, the Torah has the most important stories and teachings for the Jewish people. Um, not simply about Genesis, that you know where the world came from, but also God's covenant with Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, and then how they got out of Israel, being led by Moses, who was the lawgiver. So this is why it's very, very important for the Jews, the Torah. So there was a famous Jewish um, scholar in the Middle Ages. His name was Maimonides. And um, he counted all of the rules in the Torah and said there were 613 of them. I'm taking his word for it because I'm not going to count them myself. So there are 613 commandments that's separate from the, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are sort of in a class by themselves as the most important commandments. These other ones have to do with other rules, like some of them had to do with sacrifice, the sacrifice of animals. And of course, Jews don't sacrifice animals anymore, but others were dietary regulations. Almost all of us are somewhat familiar with those. There are also laws about the treatment of women and slaves and, and animals. Um, and many of the laws contain rules of ritual purity. So Moses wrote down these laws as the Lord directed him, maybe around the year 1250. There isn't agreement exactly on when Moses lived, but I think that's a pretty good number. So 1250 BC. So that's 1200 so or so years before the time of Christ. And one of the things that it says is that you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And a couple of examples are given. One of the things that was very strictly forbidden was to gather wood for a, for a fire to, or to start a fire, which involved a lot of labor. And um, But there were so many other things that weren't addressed. They didn't try to think about the future, what other events might come up or what developments might take place and how those would be addressed by the laws. So as the time passed from the time of Moses to the time of Christ, lots of questions arose. Is this work? We know we're not supposed to work. That is one of the big pen. Uh, I'm sorry, the big 10. It is one of the big 10. Um, keep the, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. So um, the that meant you weren't supposed to work. You were supposed to, um, you know, pray to the Lord and you were supposed to rest and spend your time with your family and this kind of a thing. But over the centuries, a lot of questions arose, such as whether or not a particular action was work and um, what would happen if you really needed to do something which would ordinarily be considered work, but it was an emergency. Was there an exception for that? So as the centuries passed, a, a secondary body of rules developed to answer those questions. And they were never written down, even up to the time of Christ. Later they were. But in the time of Christ, we were talking about the first century, those rules had not been written down. And they were called the oral law. And here, in this story that we're going to hear about, um, they're referred to as the traditions of the elders, the tradition of the elders. And now by this time, by the time of Christ, the tradition of the elder, the, or, the elders, the oral law consisted of thousands of additional rules that expanded on the 613 written rules that are actually in the Bible. So, Chrysostom knows and actually mentions the fact that Moses himself said that no one was supposed to add to or subtract from what he had given them. And this is mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter four, verse two. But still, this did not stop, you know, the the um, the Jews from expanding upon the laws or I don't think they would have considered it an expansion. They would have said we're just applying what we already have. But they did a lot, um, create a lot more rules that had become a burden. And they called the law a yoke. 
Y-O-K-E, a yoke. That's that heavy beam that is placed upon the shoulders of animals to keep them going straight, you see? So for them, that's what the law was. But they thought it was wonderful. They said, it's wonderful. The law is God-given. It's holy. It's a blessing. But the Lord really thought that by the time he was incarnate and had his ministry, that the law had become a terrible burden. So that's why he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Because he was not requiring uh, the observance all of, the, of all of these oral rules. Now, one of the problems was, that those rules were not written down. The oral laws were not written. So most people didn't even know about them or they didn't know about all of them. And so they couldn't keep them. And later, by the way, those oral laws were written down and were called the Mishnah. So the Mishnah is the compilation of the, the writing, the written oral laws that this took place around the year 200, 200 after the time of Christ. Um, but don't say that the oral law is the Mishnah, okay? Because the oral law is oral. Later, it was written down, the, the written portion, the written um, compilation is called the Mishnah. But don't call the oral laws the Mishnah because they're not. They were oral. They were, and the Mishnah is a writing. So at any rate, the laws were expanded and became a burden. But the people who, at the time of Christ who were elaborating on these laws were the Pharisees. And even though we think of them as kind of really rigid and conservative, actually, believe it or not, the Pharisees were the liberal ones. They were the progressive ones because they kept adapting the laws to changing times. And that's still happening because the successors of the Pharisees today is, or we could say the roots of modern Judaism are in Pharisaic Judaism. So Pharisaic Judaism continues to observe the law, at least those Jews who continue to follow the law. Now, a lot of questions arise even today. Is this a violation of the law to use this device or this technique or whatever? So, for example, after cars were invented, you didn't have to walk to the synagogue anymore. The question was, can you drive a car? Is that considered work on the Sabbath? Can you um, turn on your oven? And the answer in both cases was no. When Moses wrote the law, there were no ovens and there were certainly not electric or gas ovens and there were no cars. There were no cell phones. Now there are cell phones. Can you turn on your cell phone on the Sabbath? Is that considered work? And the answer is yes, it is considered work by the rabbis of today. But somebody has to make that decision. And those kinds of questions were being asked even in the time of Christ and before. So when Jesus gets in trouble for breaking the rules, he's not really breaking anything that's in the Bible. This is what you need to understand. He's breaking those oral laws that had developed later that they had created, the Pharisees themselves and their predecessors had created. So for example, you can't work on the Sabbath. Well, can you heal on the Sabbath? And they said, no, that's work. But Jesus obviously did not agree because Jesus himself did not violate the law. The Lord would not violate the law that he created. So that was an additional law that they had created themselves, and they believed that they were doing the right thing by creating standards for holiness. So the rabbis were, were the leaders of this party called the Pharisees, and their main concern was to encourage ritual purity by all Jews. And of course, whenever you have any group, somebody in the group always wants to outdo everybody else. So if a person is fasting like this, the next guy is going to fast like this. And the next guy wants to show he's even more scrupulous. He fasts even higher. And so we see this in the parable of the publican and the Pharisee. Fasting on Mondays and Fridays was actually not required, but it was done out of religious scrupulosity by the Pharisees. And so he's showing that he's gone when he stands up in the temple and prays in the parable, um, I fast twice a week. He's not doing the norm. He's doing something that was considered 
above and beyond what was required. Um, he says, I tithe from everything that I get, but you're not supposed to tithe what you receive. You're supposed to tithe. You're supposed to tithe uh, what you what you earn. Okay, and we see Jesus later, he's going to condemn the scribes and Pharisees for even tithing down to the spices in their kitchen cabinets. That's how scrupulous they were. But this led to them becoming very self-righteous, very proud, very arrogant. And they also had the tendency, unfortunately, to look down on the ordinary Jews who were just trying to survive. And actually, some of them said no, uh, none of the people of the land will be saved. The people of the land is talking about like the ordinary people, the great unwashed masses. They called them the people of the land. Well, that's a pretty pathetic thing to say, but they believe that unless you really knew all of the law and you kept it very scrupulously, you couldn't possibly be saved. So they didn't have much concern for the ordinary people. They didn't try to make their lives better. They just piled on more and more rules and expectations for them. So those are the Pharisees. They're interested in promoting ritual purity and observance of all of the rules of the law as much as possible. Now, the scribes are often seen together with the, scribe, the Pharisees, and those are the absolute experts in the law. Okay, the scribes. Now, normally when we say scribe, we mean someone who writes or copies texts or something like this. But in this case, in, the, in Judaism, a scribe was a lawyer. That's why sometimes the Bible refers to lawyers. A lawyer came up and questioned Jesus. In Luke's gospel and Mark's gospel, they call them lawyers so that their Greek audience would understand who are these people. They're experts in the law. And so they memorized all of those thousands of oral laws and the different interpretations because there was no consensus about how to apply these laws. There were different ideas, but those things were considered a kind of legal precedent for the Jews. So the scribes and the Pharisees are together. They both believed that you had to be righteous before God. And the way you accomplish this righteousness was through ritual purity. And that has nothing to do with physical purity. So when the Bible talks about what is clean or unclean, I think you already know this. It has nothing to do with what is physically clean or the person who is physically clean, but whether or not they were acceptable in the eyes of God because they had followed all of the rules. They were ritually pure. So um, they were very concerned about Jesus and they challenged him a lot because they thought that he was giving a very bad advice. He was a very poor example as a rabbi because he himself was breaking these laws of ritual purity. So now let's go ahead and talk about the fact that they're going to challenge him about keeping the tradition of the elders. So this is one of those passages in which, um, from which, about which, uh, from which we should say Protestants derive this idea that tradition is a bad thing, or they point to it and say, you see tradition, Jesus doesn't like traditions, and uh, you shouldn't be keeping any traditions. Of course, the Orthodox are all about apostolic tradition. So they point to this passages like this, references to tradition, and they say, we, we the Orthodox, are keeping the traditions of men. But of course, we are not keeping the traditions of men. We are following traditions of the Lord, Jesus Christ, who was God. So the traditions that we keep are the traditions that God himself established in the person of Jesus Christ and gave to the apostles. When Jesus is criticizing tradition, he is criticizing them and calling them the traditions of men because those rules had been created by the Pharisees. Those were not God-given rules. They were not in the Torah. Those were additional rules that they had created themselves. Okay, so this is what he is complaining to them about and saying that they had become kind of a burden that was hard for people to bear. So 
it is not correct. Even the Orthodox idea, idea of tradition is different from the Catholic idea of tradition because Catholics also say that they're following apostolic tradition, but they are not, not the way that the Orthodox are. The Orthodox view is to preserve the traditions that we received from the apostles without changing them. But for Catholics, the, um, the tradition is preserved by Rome. So they have come to believe and they've been told for generations that if Rome says something or teaches something or does something, it is correct according to apostolic tradition because Rome kind of guarantees that the church is correctly following apostolic tradition, even if they change it, even if they expand upon it, etc. But that's not the Orthodox view. So even though Catholics say scripture and tradition, the Orthodox really should stay away from that because that is a Catholic response to Protestant objections. And it doesn't really reflect uh, the Catholic understanding of tradition really doesn't reflect the Orthodox understanding of apostolic tradition because we have preserved things very faithfully that the Catholic Church has changed over the hundreds of years. So I think that's sufficient of an introduction. Let's go ahead and talk about um, what defiles a man. And it begins with the Pharisees confronting Jesus. So this is chapter 15 of the Gospel of Matthew, verses 1 to 9. Then Pharisees and scribes came to, Jeru to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, And why do you transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother. And he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or mother, what you have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. So, all right. So let's take a look at this, first of all. Um, that Notice in the very first verse, it says that Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem, and he's up in Galilee. So this seems to be some kind of a delegation, some kind of um, important people who were sent from the powers in Jerusalem, the religious authorities, to come up and check out Jesus. He's made his... His fame, of course, is spread, and they want to know who he is and what he stands for. And so they must have seen him allowing his disciples to eat with unwashed hands, or as Mark puts it, with defiled hands. That's what they would consider them, defiled hands. So what about this? It doesn't mean that their hands were necessarily physically dirty so that they shouldn't eat. Now, of course, we all believe that you should wash your hands before you eat. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a ritual that was done with certain prayers to wash your hands in the ritual manner prior to eating. And as a good rabbi, Jesus should have been doing this and teaching his disciples to do the same, but he doesn't insist on this. Now, does it say in the Torah that you have to wash your hands in a ritual fashion before you eat? No, that's one of the rules that the Pharisees themselves had invented. It's not in the Bible, okay? So they challenged him about this. The Pharisees challenged him about this and he does not answer. He doesn't defend himself. Instead, he answers their question with a question, which is very typical of him, but also as you should know by now, it's a typical rabbinic technique to answer a question with another question. But in this case, he really puts them on the defensive. Now, um, what does he ask them? Uh, when they talk about the tradition of the elders, we, talk, we talked about what that is, the, the oral rules, the oral laws. Um, when they ask him the question, he turns it around and points out 
that they are violating the actual commandments of God. And he points out a violation of one of the Ten Commandments, not just one of these 613 rules in the Torah, but how they don't even observe one of the Ten Commandments. And they're encouraging people to violate that. So let's first of all talk about the hand washing and how this shows the character of the Pharisees to try to um, show how pious and righteous they were by going beyond what the law required. In the Bible, it says that the hands have to be washed for prior to certain cultic acts. That is, things that have to do with the temple, with sacrifice, with offering sacrifice. But here we're talking about just ordinary washing your hands prior to eating a meal. So this is very typical of the Pharisees to want to take, and this is actually, this is well documented, that there were many laws of ritual purity that were required for priests that the Pharisees themselves began to follow to try to achieve a kind of higher level of ritual purity. Well, they're not priests. It wasn't asked of them, but they were doing these things that they considered um, especially important to be examples for the other people and to make sure that they were completely ritually pure. So it was kind of, um, you were you were expected to undergo certain ritual washings and prayers if you touched something that was unclean, like a dead body or an unclean animal that had died, things like this. Yes, you were supposed to wash your hands in a ritual manner. But here, if you hadn't washed anything, uh, touched anything unclean, you don't have to wash it in a ritual manner. But the Pharisees were doing that with a sort of, as a sort of add-on, um, extra insurance, we can say, extra protection, just in case I touch something unclean and I was unaware of it, I will wash my hands. Okay, it was that kind of a thing. Okay, so they're going overboard beyond what the law required, but they were very proud of that. They were proud of the fact that they went beyond what the law required. So what does the Lord say to them? To point out to them, because here that you think they think that they are really in a position to correct everyone else because they're not only keeping the law, they're going beyond what the law requires. So they're super righteous, super uh, ritually pure, etc., cetera, et cetera. So the Lord says, why do you transgress the commandment? <clears throat> doesn't defend himself, doesn't deny that he doesn't teach his disciples to ritually wash their hands. Instead, he says that they are transgressing an actual commandment, one of the Ten Commandments, by their own rules, by their own man-made rules. And this is what it was, the commandment to honor your father and mother, which is one of the big ten, as you know. Well, here's what happened. Here's what the Lord said. For God commanded, honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother, let him surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is a gift given to God, he need not honor his father. So in the original Greek here of the Gospel of Matthew, it just says, if anyone says to his parents, um, what I would have given you is a gift, then it doesn't explain here what that means. But we know that what it means is that if a person decided to dedicate their property to the temple as a temple offering, in other words, it's a gift, but it's a gift to God. It's not saying here that they're, he's giving a gift to their parents, but it's a gift dedicated to God at the temple. Then they were exempt from using that money for anything else. And this was a kind of legal loophole that was being um was being exploited by some people who didn't want to take care of their parents in their old age. So what is translated here as gift, and Mark actually uses the original Aramaic word, which is korban. Anything that is korban means something that's dedicated to God. And this is the ironic part. You could continue to use it in your lifetime for yourself but you could deny you weren't supposed to use it for anybody else, including your parents. Okay. So the Korban is a gift to God, 
was designated as an offering to Lord. This made it sacred. And so not only was it, could the person say, well, I can't use it for you because it's dedicated to God. Even the parents, once they know that their child had dedicated this money to God, might be re reluctant to receive any money from their child, their son. These, this would be sons because it would be like sacrilege. Okay. But it was a legal loophole. And many people who were greedy, didn't want to support their elderly parents, took advantage of this. But this law was created by the Pharisees. So Jesus um, talks about this. And let's see what St. Jerome says about it. And then we'll take a little break. Here is what Jerome says. And by the way, this was so interesting. I was not aware of this. He says this, in consideration of the parents' frailty, age, or poverty, the Lord had commanded that sons should honor their parents, namely by ministering to them the necessities of life. But the scribes and Pharisees wanted to subvert this most provident law of God in order to introduce impiety under the name of piety. That's why Jesus will call them hypocrites. Okay? They're introducing impiety under the guise or the name of piety. Jerome says it so well. They taught wicked sons that if anyone wanted to make a vow to God, who was their true father, of the things that were to be offered to their parents, then the Lord's offering should be placed ahead of the gifts to the parents. Or at least when the parents saw that these things had been dedicated to God, they would be done in by their need, declining these things from fear of incurring the charge of sacrilege. That was under the pretext of God and temple, but the children's offering would yield a profit to the priests. So look, there's this undercurrent of corruption that's also going on there, okay? So the Lord here is contrasting the commandment of God with this man-made rule, which actually contravenes and violates the very purpose of one of the Ten Commandments. And the Lord points out their hypocrisy, the fact that they actually have no devotion to God. They're pretending to be pious and righteous and looking out for the, the ritual purity of Israel, but actually they are great hypocrites. And he quotes from Isaiah about them. But we're at half an hour into our program, so let's take a break, and when we return, we will see what the Lord says and continue our discussion. Join me after the break. Dr. Constantino will be back in a moment, but the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. So here's a question for you. What does it mean to think orthodox? What are the unspoken and unexplored premises and presumptions underlying what Christians believe? Orthodox Christianity is based on preserving the mind of the early church, its phronima. Dr. Jeannie Constantino brings her more than 40 years experience as a professor, Bible teacher, and speaker to bear in explaining what the orthodox phronima is, how it can be acquired, and how that phronema is expressed in true Orthodox theology as practiced by those who are properly qualified by both training and a deep relationship with Christ. Thinking Orthodox, now available at store.ancientfaith.com. That's store.ancientfaith.com. We are back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantino. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. Okay, so the Lord calls them hypocrites. You know, it sounds so harsh, but it was appropriate. So appropriate. So this is what he says in verses 6 to 7. So for the sake of your tradition... You have made void the word of God. You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. 
In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. So, of course, in the Orthodox Church, when we have followed traditions, these are traditions like we're about to begin with Great Lent, fasting and things like this, and they are not designed as kind of tricky backdoor ways around keeping certain laws or certain expectations of God. They're designed, our traditions are designed to help us worship God better, to be better Christians, not as legal loopholes, which is what the Pharisees created. And here's St. John Chrysostom speaking about that. Having then signified that they who were trampling on the law could not be justly entitled to blame men for transgressing a commandment of certain elders, he points out this same thing again from the prophet. So he's called it, calling upon Isaiah's authority. It's, it's enough that the Lord pointed it out, but now he's quoting Isaiah. Having once laid hold of them severely, he proceeds further as on every occasion he brings forward the scriptures. And so proving himself to be in accordance with God. Therefore, the good reason, for good reason, the, the disciples did not follow their rule about ritually washing their hands. So they are hypocrites because they profess to give an offering to God. They prof profess to be living a life in that's pleasing to God, but they're actually contravening his express will, in this case, by the example the Lord gives, uh, to support elderly parents. So Chrysostom points out that he does not mention the elders, but calls it their tradition. That's a really good point. He doesn't say um, you are promoting the tradition of the elders. He says your tradition. It's tradition of men. He doesn't say that's what the elders say, but you say this. For the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. So um, they're not only violating uh, their own oral tradition, they're violating one, of, violating one of the Ten Commandments. And Chrysostom points out that people who are trying to point out the sins of others should be very careful. They shouldn't be so strict with others when they themselves are violating even bigger sins than that. They're criticizing the disciples for violating a kind of a minor commandment, but um, actually they're criticizing Christ for allowing the disciples to violate one of these minor commandments while they themselves are breaking one of the big 10. Chrysostom says the following, two evils arose. On the one hand, they did not bring the offering to God. So in other words, somebody who was um, inclined to make an offering, they did not bring the offering to God. And on the other hand, they defrauded their parents under the name of the offering. What does he mean they did not make the offering? The person doesn't actually necessarily bring the offering to God. They're continuing to use it for their whole life. So they're not really making an offering to God. They're not giving a, making any kind of a sacrificial offering, taking from their substance, taking from their wealth to make an offering to God. They're just dedicating it to God. It's going to go to God after I die. Okay. So he says they're not really making an offering to God and they're defrauding their parents under the name of the offering both insulting their parents for God's sake and insulting God for their parents' sake. Okay, this is a brilliant analysis by Chrysostom. He does not say this at once, but first reminds them of the law, which by which he signifies his earnest desire that parents should be honored. So um, he's reminding them of the seriousness of this commandment. Uh, to honor our parents, but by reminding them that in the Old Testament, it actually says that somebody who insults their parents is liable to the death penalty. That's pretty harsh. So that's, that is given to show how seriously the Lord took this commandment to take care of our elderly parents. And, you know, when you think about it, um, that when we're born, we are completely helpless as little babies, we need our parents to do everything for us. And then very often, if they live long enough, the role gets reversed and they need us to take care of them. And isn't that appropriate? So just as parents are responsible for, for their infant children, their young children, to care for them, so are we responsible for our parents. So Chrysostom says this, he implies them to be wor this worthy 
of death because he says that somebody who doesn't take care of them, even insults their parents, forget about not caring for their parents. The, the law says they should surely die. For if he who dishonors them in word is punished, much more you who do so indeed, you, he's referring to the Pharisees, who not only dishonor, but teach it to others. They really, the Pharisees made it possible for people to get around this requirement that they take care of elderly parents. Now, just imagine what that was like, because it's not like today where people get some kind of a pension or social security, or maybe there's elder housing where they can live, you know, subsidized housing that didn't exist. If your children didn't take care of you, you're on the street as a beggar. So it's, it's, it's not only are they creating the law, but they're making that, making it possible then for people to violate that essential commandment. So he says, you then, Chrysostom says, putting in the mouth of Christ, who ought not so much as live because of the commandment. How can you find fault with the disciples? And Chrysostom says that he aggravated the charge against them by citing the prophet. And he stops speaking to the Pharisees, and it's true. In the next part, he turns and speaks to the people, and he stops re responding to what the Pharisees said because, according to Christism, they're incorrigible. He's right. They're incorrigible. So he directs his speech to the crowd and introduces his lofty doctrine uh, that is not concerned with meat. So he addresses the crowd, and he says, hear and understand. So he's calling that for them to pay attention and uh, understand what he's saying to them. So this is the next pericope that we're going to discuss tonight. And this is Matthew 15, verses 10 to 20. And this is the, the heart of the matter of what, it can, what makes a person defiled in the sight of God or unclean in the sight of God. And he called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a man. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them both alone, for they are blind guides. And if a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. And the Lord said, are you so still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and so passes on? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So he begins by ignoring the Pharisees. Now this, remember, is this important delegation, presumably important delegation that was probably sent up from Jerusalem to investigate this <clears throat> preacher rabbi Jesus. And he turns away from them and begins to address the crowd and says, it's not what goes into the mouth of a person that defiles him, but what comes, defiles him, but what comes out of him. So now he's making this distinction between a purely ritual purity and virtue, the, the true purity that God desires. It's not the first time that we've seen this in the gospel, but now it becomes very, very explicit. And first, let's turn to St. Jerome and what he says about this. <clears throat> he says that the Jews were boasting that they are God's portion. They are the people of God. And they called food that all people could eat common. For example, or also the things that they considered unclean, sometimes they would call it kinon, common. In Greek, it's common. And that was things like, Swine flesh, oysters, hare, rabbits, animals that do not have a split foot. These are all the things that were considered unclean and they were not allowed to eat. Um, this is why in the Acts of the Apostles, it is written, what God has sanctified, you should not call common. 
It is called common then instead of unclean because it is open to other men and not used for the portion of God. An intelligent reader might object and say, if what enters the mouth does not defile a man, why do we not eat things sacrificed to idols? That's a very good question. Because at the time of Jerome, at the time of Chrysostom, because you know they're, they're so famous, they're so well known by us, we kind of think of the fact that everybody in the empire was a Christian, but that was not the case. In Chrysostom's time, only 45% of the city of Antioch was Christian. And so Jerome is, is living for a while, and I'm not sure where he was when he was writing this commentary. He lived in Rome. He lived, in, he lived outside of Antioch for a while. He lived in Bethlehem for a while. But the majority of people in the empire were not Christians. So there were still lots of pagan temples around. And there were some pagan priests who were offering sacrifices. And of course, it's forbidden for Christians to participate in that by eating those kinds of foods. So Jerome is addressing the fact that, well, um, if it's not what goes into you that defiles you, why is it forbidden for us to eat food which had been offered to idols? And this is his answer. Because um, you cannot, because this comes from, of course, St. Paul, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. So Jerome's answer is that these foods are, yes, of God's creatures. So let's say somebody offered a pig and sacrificed to Zeus. Well, you can't eat it, not because there's anything wrong with a pig, but because it had been offered to idols, and that was considered an offering to demons, and that's what makes it unclean. So we're not supposed to have food offered to demons. We can make the same analogy today with foods that are offered in Hindu temples or offered to boot in front of Buddhist statues. Sometimes, you know, you go someplace and there's a there's a business that has a um, uh, in a, a little statue of the Buddha, and very often they'll have little fruits there. That's not for you, by the way. <laughs> but even if it was offered to you, you shouldn't eat it, okay? Because it has been offered to an idol, okay? So that makes it unclean, not because there's anything specifically unclean about that food according to its actual nature. So uh, the disciples, of course, are very perplexed by this and actually said, to the Lord, do you know that we're going on now? This is verse 12. The disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? And he answered, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. So, we're told that the Pharisees were highly offended and the word is scandalized. That's the, the word that's almost always translated as offended. They're totally scandalized because the response of the Lord really not only undermines their authority, but it, it really conflicts with what they stand for, everything that they stand for, that the person who is acceptable to God is the person who keeps ritual purity. That's the main you know, calling card of the Pharisees, their main point, their, the purpose for their existence is to encourage ritual purity. That's why Jesus is always um, criticizing them because they didn't care at all about inner purity, the purity of the heart. He's going to expand on that. We'll learn more about it. So he points out their hypocrisy and Basically, he's wounded their ego. He's made them look like fools by pointing out the fact that they are not only contravening this tradition that was created by human beings, but actual commandments of God. So they're really not, he's pointing out hypocrisy, etc. So this is why they're scandalized. It was very scandalous. His teaching was scandalous. I don't think he convinced them, by the way. He did not convince them. Why did he not convince them? I mean, it's a perfectly valid argument. But they had come to believe that they, as the leaders of Israel, were right because they had been given these positions, these positions, especially these Pharisees coming from Jerusalem. They must have been very wealthy, very well connected, highly respected, men of very greatly esteemed. And they believed that God 
gave them those positions because they are righteous. In other words, whatever good things you have in life, it's because God has approved of you. Jesus, of course, is nothing. Jesus is nothing but a hillbilly country bumpkin preacher from Nazareth. Okay, so, and he's got no formal education um, from any official rabbinic uh, school or uh, never sat at the feet of a rabbi. He's not coming from wealth or privilege or famous family. So Jesus is really nothing to them. That's what you need to understand. That's why in spite of the fact that we can see the logic behind what the Lord is saying, the truth behind what he's saying, they would not accept it. They assumed that they knew better. Okay. Because, because they had the position and he was nothing socially speaking. Okay. In terms of the society, he had no positions of importance. And this is why they had to find a way to explain the miracles. Well, how do you explain all these miracles? Well, he does them with the power of the devil. That's, that's where that came from. So, um, so in the previous pericope, he was criticized by those Pharisees for not teaching his disciples to wash their hands in a ritual fashion before eating. But now he turns to the food itself before he didn't really mention the food. And now he's talking about the food. And this is very important because it was it was an issue even after the time, after Christ ascended, it remained kind of an issue in the early church. And we know that the apostles had to address that, whether or not Gentile converts to the church had to keep the law of Moses. And St. Paul talks about this himself. And he says, food does not commend us to God. And But you, you have to understand how, how complex these rules become and how they take over your life. So most of us know very little about the rituals that are practiced even by modern observant Jews. Um, but we all know the basic idea of kosher laws, I think. At least just about everybody knows that Jews are not allowed to eat pork. That's, But that's only one of the things that they're not allowed to eat. But no Jew in Christ's time or before or after, no Jew had ever said that what you ate didn't matter or didn't defile you. No Jew had ever said that until we could maybe say very recently, all Jews were keeping these kinds of rules. It's kind of hard for us to understand how shocking it was to hear the Lord say, it's not what you eat that defiles you. This was completely shocking, completely scandalous. Because until really the creation of reform Judaism, the kind of modern Jew Judaism where they don't keep the laws of Moses, the laws of ritual purity, that really only happened in the 1880s. And that was started in New York. Prior to that, all Jews kept these laws because you're a Gentile if you don't. You're not even Jewish if you don't at least keep the dietary regulations and most of the laws of ritual purity. And by the way, the reason why even the reform Judaism was very small and it started in America in the 19th century, it became kind of routine for most Jews not to keep the law. And you know where and how? Because in America, when Jewish soldiers joined the war effort in World War II and they were shipped overseas and they were being fed. They weren't keeping kosher and they were eating alongside of, of Gentile um, servicemen. And that's really when when the, the sort of ordinary life of Jews, especially in, in the United States, changed. And then they moved to the suburbs, away from their centers in the cities um, where they were able to buy kosher food and keep all of these rituals. And so this is how that really dissipated this um, insistence on following kosher laws. Now it's only the minority of Jews that really keep these kosher laws. And I have to tell you, but there are, and you have to live in a community to cause that to happen. I don't know if I've told you this story before, but it kind of shows how clueless I am. You know, even as a Bible scholar, I was kind of clueless about this because when we lived uh, in on Long Island, South Shore, Long Island, um, and they're in a very Jewish neighborhood, and there were three synagogues uh, near our church, and um, 
and we lived just a few blocks away from the church in this very Jewish area. So one of the reasons why these uh, these become enclaves where Jews live, and a lot of them were keeping kosher, and they were observe, living observant laws lives, is because they needed to live close enough to the synagogue so they could walk on Sundays and not drive a car. So when we were looking at houses to buy in this area, we saw a lot of houses that had two kitchens. And I thought that was very interesting. There was a stove and a refrigerator on this level, there was sort of a split level. Then on another level, there was another kitchen with another set of pots and pans and stove refrigerator. And I, I was thinking, well, maybe their mother-in-law lives with them and she likes to cook. So they needed another kitchen. That's what would happen. That's what I was thinking, because that's what mothers-in-law do. They come over and they start cooking. So she has her own kitchen to cook. And then, I, then the daughter would have, or the daughter-in-law would have her own kitchen. But no, it took me like, after seeing quite a few of these houses, and I'm thinking, they have two kitchens. Why are there so many? Oh, of course, they're keeping kosher. So you can't even put the milk and the meat products in the same refrigerator. You can't cook them in the same pots and pans. You can't use the same dishes with milk products and meat products. This is how those laws of ritual purity have expanded even farther and farther since the time of Christ to you know, what we would call um, extremes that would be unnecessary. So here's St. John Chrysostom. The Lord did not say the observance of meats is nothing, nor that Moses had given wrong injunctions, not so but in the way of admonition and counsel, taking his testimony from the nature of things. So of course the Lord does not want to scandalize the crowd. He doesn't care if the Pharisees are offended, but the crowd, he's not going to say Moses was wrong, or I'm going to teach you something new because they could not accept that. We've just seen that the, that the disciples could not accept what the Lord had said. So he says this, uh, res resorting to the nature, uh, nature itself, by his enactment and in his demonstration. In other words, it's not the things that go into the mouth that defile him, but the things that come out of the mouth. Neither did they say, what are you saying? Okay, the Pharisees, didn't, the Pharisees heard this. They didn't reply and they didn't say, they didn't object. When God has given such charges without number concerning the observance of meats, you make such laws because there's a whole chapter in Leviticus about what you can eat and what you cannot eat. And as I said, since that time, they've added more. But since he had utterly stopped their mouths, not only by refuting them, but by publishing their craft and exposing what was done by them in secret, that is, that they were finding loopholes or around having to support your parents and making sure that eventually that money went to the priests and the corrupt priests of the temple. That may have be part of this Jerusalem connection. By exposing what was done by them in secret and revealing the secrets of their minds, their mouths were stopped and they went away. And so they went away and what does he say? Every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be rooted up. Leave them alone. They are blind guides. And if a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. So the Jews often use this image of plants as planted by God to refer to themselves and their communities. And we kind of do that too. You know, people say, well, I planted a church. We have the same custom. And even when the bishop comes to visit a congregation um, during the Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal hymn, he will stand up and he'll quote from the psalm. He says, uh, Lord, Lord, look down upon your the vineyard which your right hand has planted. So the Pharisees also use this image because Jesus is now saying that God did not plant them. God did not plant these rules. He did not plant this plant and it's going to be removed. It's sort of hinting at what will happen later with the church, when the church will not follow these rules of ritual purity and dietary regulations. But the plant imagery also reminds us of a parable. Do you remember that parable from chapter 13? What was the parable? The wheat and the tares, that there will be some weeds mixed in with the wheat, and God did not plant them. The enemy planted them secretly at night, but they're going to be there for a while, and then the Lord will bring in the wheat into the barns and burn the weeds later. So the Lord did not feel bound by these rulings or traditions that had, especially the ones that transgressed the commandments of God, but the ones that were created by the Pharisees themselves. The Lord himself is not opposed to tradition, 
period, because the Lord created his own traditions and he gave them to, to the disciples to follow. When the Lord ascended to heaven, what did he say? Did he leave a book of rules, of written rules? Did he leave scripture behind? No. He said, um, he said to the disciples, go out and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded to you. In other words, and where is that written down? It's not written down anywhere. So he taught them everything orally, and he taught them to keep those traditions, to observe those things which he had taught them. That's what we're talking about. So the Lord gave lots of traditions. So he wasn't opposed to tradition. The Lord did not teach sola scriptura. That's for sure. Okay. So the Pharisees were offended by what he said, not the multitudes. And Chrysostom says this. What did he say? He did not remove the offense in respect to them, but reprove them saying, every plant which my heavenly father has pl not planted will be rooted up. For his want to both despise offenses and not despise them. Everywhere, elsewhere he said, um, lest we offend them. Later we'll, we'll see. It's very interesting. This is a really good point. Because Jesus wasn't always willing to offend people. Sometimes he tried not to offend. And so look at the discernment that the Lord uses. And we're going to see this later when he's asked about paying the taxes or when Peter's asked about whether or not he and the master have paid the taxes. And the Lord says, we don't have to pay the taxes, but lest we offend them, go cast your line and catch this fish and they paid the taxes. Um, but here's what Chrysostom says. By, but these things, his disciples said, when they said, oh, you offended the Pharisees. They didn't say them because they were worried about the Pharisees, but themselves also being slightly perplexed. They dared not say so in their own person. They would prefer to be saying, oh, 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 the Pharisees are offended. What What do you mean by that? They didn't want to say, hey, we don't know if we can accept this. So they. this is what Chrysostom is hinting, and I think he's right. It was easy for them to say the Pharisees were offended and so that they could get an explanation from him. Sometimes they were reluctant to ask him things directly. We see this multiple times in the scriptures. Now, they, he still doesn't explain it until Peter says, declare to us this parable. And here again, you can see that Peter was re really wanted an answer. He also did not understand this. He didn't say openly, I'm offended too, or I'm shocked too, or I'm scandalized too. What do you mean that nothing that we eat can defile us? So this is why the Lord um, speaks in this way, and then he's going to answer it. But um, these are their traditions, their traditions that he is objecting to. And the Lord says, when they say, oh, they were scandalized, the disciples said the Pharisees were scandalized. He says, leave them alone. They're blind guides. They're both going to, they're all going to fall into a pit. So notice that there's a certain patience and tolerance that he's recommending here, as he did with the kingdom parables. He says to ignore them. They will come to nothing because the blind lead the blind into a pit. But he also says that he shows that he's not against the, the commandments of God at all or any kinds of traditions, but against these ones that they had created, especially ones that contravene the direct commandments of the Lord. So uh, the Chrysostom says um, they are the, the blind are leading the blind. It is a great evil merely to be blind. Now, he doesn't mean physically blind. He means, of course, being unwilling to see in this case, but to be in such a case and have none to lead him to occupy the place of a guide is double and triple ground of censure. For if it be a dangerous thing for the blind man not to have a guide much more so that he should not desire to be guide to another. Oh, there's a lot we could say about that, but we have uh, reached the top of the hour. So let's go ahead and take a break. And when we come back, We'll see what the fathers say about the blind guides and some nice uh, patristic statements to get us ready for Lent. Join me at the break. Dr. Constantinou will be back in a moment, but the lines are open for your calls. The number is 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO.
Ancient Faith's Lampstand Institute is an introductory media training forum for Orthodox Christians aged 18 to 23 who are interested in learning skills in digital media and applying them to the service of the church. At Lampstand, a group of 10 students will gather to learn the essentials of podcasting and video production and the why and how of Orthodox media ministry. Students will execute their own digital media projects under the direction of Ancient Faith staff and network. Upon the program's conclusion, participants will leave with foundational ministry experience, technical and creative skills, and career mentors. The weekend will include sessions on podcasting, audio production, live radio, video making, marketing, and media ministry, plus open work sessions for recording radio material, refining a personal project, and preparing a live radio broadcast. The Institute will take place at the Ancient Faith Ministries headquarters in Chesterton, Indiana on July 18th through the 21st, 2024. Programming will begin Thursday, July 18th at 6.30 p.m. and conclude with Divine Liturgy and Lunch on Sunday morning. For more information and to apply, please visit ancientfaith.com. That's ancientfaith.com. We are back with Search the Scriptures Live with Dr. Jeannie Constantino. Have a question about the verses we are studying tonight? Give her a call at 855-237-2346. Here once again is Dr. Jeannie. All right, so Peter also wants this explained, and none of them have the courage to ask Jesus about it. So Peter says, um, explain this parable to us. Now, it's not a parable. It's a direct statement. So he said, but he says, explain this parable. And then the Lord is a bit harsh with his reaction. Are you still without understanding? Do you not see that what goes out of the mouth, pa mouth passes into the stomach and so passes on? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a man. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So uh, Chris also says that it's not that Peter did not understand. Of course he understood, but he really found it very difficult to uh, accept and this is why he asks, he calls it a parable. <laughs> okay, it's not a parable. There's nothing symbolic about it. Jesus says, nothing you eat defiles you. It's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. So Chrysostom says he was afraid, lest he should be thought of having taken offense. So he asserts it to be obscure. However, it is not obscure. But he was offended. That he was offended is manifest because it had nothing of obscurity. So Christ rebukes him saying, are you also yet without understanding? As to the multitude, they perhaps did not understand the saying, but themselves, they themselves, the disciples were the persons offended. Wherefore, as though asking on behalf of the Pharisees, they desired to be told. And he, of course, the Lord responds. And St. Jerome says that, um, that at first, of course, what has been said openly was accessible for hearing. The apostle Peter talks a bit about it as a parable in a manner that is manifest. He is seeking a mystical understanding, but he is reproached by the Lord for having thought that what he spoke clearly was said parabolically. The lesson from this is that a hearer is at fault who wants to understand either obscure things clearly or things that have been said plainly as obscure matters. That's a really good point because sometimes we take things that are plain and then we make them complicated or obscure and vice versa. We're not supposed to do this. This is very clear what he means by it. So he's saying that about the blind leading the blind, St. Jerome says that after the first and second admonition, we should avoid heretical men knowing that such are perverted and self-condemned. In this sense, the Savior also commands that bad teachers should be left to their own choice. He knows it is difficult for them to be able to draw to the truth. They are blind and they draw blind people into error. That's a very good point because sometimes we sit and argue with them. Isn't this what's happening on the internet? People are arguing with the blind guides and the heretical people. They're arguing with them again and again. Leave them alone. What's the point of arguing with them? 
It says they're blind guides. They're going to fall into a pit. There is um, nothing that you can really do to change these people. And sometimes we foolishly think by just arguing and giving more proofs and, you know, other kinds of arguments, we're going to convince people. And that's not the case. So um, he establishes, the Lord establishes, as St. John Chrysostom says, by our common nature, the fact that what goes into us does not defile us. Um, and here's why this is St. John Chrysostom. It may be within one, if you eat the food that the Jews would consider defiling, unclean, but when it is gone forth, it is no longer. For instance, he bids you to wash yourself and be clean, measuring the time of the digestion. But the things of the heart abide within. That's why the unclean things are in the heart. They're, they abide within. And when they go forth, they come out, they defile. And not only when abiding within. At first, he puts our evil thoughts. But still, he does not make his refutation from the nature of the things, but from the manner of the production of the belly and the heart. The fact that this sort remains and the other does not. In other words, your food, if you eat something wrong, it's going to pass out of you. But what's in your heart stays there. And then it comes out and it's harmful to others. This is Chrysostom's point. The one entering in from outside and departing again, going outside. While the others are bred within and having gone forth, they defile and more so when they are gone forth because they are not yet able to be taught these things with all strictness so that disciples could not really understand these things. So I think it's good for us to discuss these things because we're entering Great Lent one week from today. It's the beginning of Great Lent, Clean Monday. And it's good for us to remember that we have to be careful that our fasting, we do, we do not become like the Pharisees with our fasting. And this is why the church, in her wisdom, puts the parable of the publican and the Pharisee in front of us, not just to teach us uh, against pride, the pride of the Pharisees, but against this kind of legalism that focuses on avoiding certain foods while allowing all kinds of other behaviors that basically violate the fast. And so very often we see fathers of the church talking about, you know, fasting from foul language, fasting from what we see with our eyes. We have to take these things into consideration, especially not to become legalists with our fasting. So we do find ourselves reading ingredient labels during Lent, but really we have to be careful that we not become Pharisees and hypocrites. So uh, by focusing precisely on the content and avoiding or destroying the purpose. So um, last Lent, I was at a retreat and they served these vegetarian burgers, these like impossible burgers. I'm not sure which brand they were. They tasted exactly like meat. I didn't feel like I was fasting. I wasn't, you know, controlling my meat intake, even though technically it wasn't meat. So you really have to ask yourself, if you find vegetarian substitutes for all these things, and it tastes just like meat, where is the discipline that fasting was intended to create within us? It becomes meaningless. And we would rightly be condemned for hypocrisy. How can we say, I fasted, when really you were eating something that tastes exactly like meat? We're not benefiting from the purpose of the fast. So when we make the fast legalistic, then we are really mocking God. And we should be so careful of that. You know, we know, most of you know, that Oreos are have no dairy. So they would be considered fasting food, but really... Are we, if we say I can have all the Oreos I want because they're fasting food, are we really fasting? Okay, so we have to look at what the objective is. The goal is not simply to fast. The fasting is a tool of discipline to help us achieve the true goal. And the true goal is purity, virtue. So this is how it relates to what the Lord was saying. They were looking at what defiles the person. They were looking for purity, but they were looking at ritual purity. The Lord wants us to acquire inner purity, inner virtue. And we need to take this very seriously 
and not simply become legalists like the Pharisees, because believe me, it's a very, it's a very scary thing. I, I don't know about you, but I, I'm worried about it because we have a tendency to become extremely um, Pharisaic in our fasting. And then worst of all, become very proud of the fact that we're fasting. So let's not do that. Let's fast, have a true fast, and not just find vegetarian substitutes uh, so that we can still eat things that taste exactly like meat or dairy or whatever. Because some of it's it's pretty good. But that's we're not fasting then. Okay, so here is St. Paisios about this. Yeronda, how does one achieve purification of the mind and heart? Here's his answer. I have told you that in order to purify the mind and the heart, one must not accept the cunning thoughts brought by the devil, nor have cunning thoughts of one's own. One must always try to have good thoughts, to avoid being scandalized easily, to view the faults of others with leniency and love. Look at that. That's the measure of purity, to view the faults of others with leniency and love, not with judgmentalism. When good thoughts are multiplied, a person is cleansed spiritually and behaves with authentic devotion and becomes peaceful and lives a life of paradise. We must work to, to achieve purification. We may recognize our wretchedness, but that is not enough. If we stopped accepting cunning thoughts and we ourselves do not think cunningly, but instead have only good thoughts about what we are told and what we see, our mind and heart will be purified, purified. Of course, the tempter will continue to send us from time to time cunning telegraphic messages. Even if we get rid of our evil thoughts, our own evil thoughts, the devil's temptations will persist, but they will not stick if our heart is pure. Yet or not, doesn't prayer help in the purification of the mind? Prayer alone is not enough. It's of no benefit to turn pounds of incense or to burn pounds of incense while we pray if our mind is filled with evil thoughts about others. The evil telegraph message is transmitted from the mind to the heart and turns a person into a beast. God wants us to have a clean heart and our heart is clean when we do not allow bad thoughts about others to pass through our mind. Yeronda, does a person first have to have a good thought and then God helps? A person is entitled to divine help only when he has good thoughts. With good thoughts, he purifies his evil heart because out of the heart proceed all evil things and out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaks. Most certainly, God will reward us for the good thoughts we have have. So St. Ignatius Brinchaninov also speaks about purity and virtue. So let's take a listen to him. What is purity? It is a virtue that is opposed to carnal passion. So now he's going to draw the connection between our, our carnality, which is what we're trying to control during Great Lent by our fasting we're trying to control our carnal impulses this is more than simply you know relations between men and women it is between but our carnal impulses are everything that has to do with the body the passions in the as when they are used incorrectly okay so he's going to draw the connection between the pursuit of virtue and the controlling of the carnal passions which we try to achieve partly through our fasting Purity is keeping the body from actively falling into sin and from all action that could lead to sin. It is the preservation of the mind from carnal thoughts and fantasy and the heart from feelings and desires of the flesh, which helps prevent the body from feeling the desires of the flesh. Some maintain that the sins of the flesh committed by the body are as equally serious and heavy as sins committed by the mind and heart. They base this opinion on the words of the Savior. Whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery 
after with her in his heart. But this is not good reasoning. Those words were spoken to add to the Old Testament commandment. It was spoken to those who considered only bodily fornication to be sinful, not understanding that the evil thoughts to, by which we include, include carnal thoughts that proceed out of the heart. These are the things which defile a man, separate him from God, and take away his purity, which is the only means to see God. See why that's important? What's in our heart? Because as he mentions, we've, we know this line, this is earlier from this gospel of Matthew, the pure in heart shall see God. So if we want to see God, we have to have a pure heart. Enjoyment of carnal thoughts and emotions is fornication of the heart and defilement of the person, making him incapable of communion with God. While fornication of the body is a fundamental change of the entire person's nature due to his mixing with another body. Fornication of the body is complete isolation from God, death and perdition. In order to come out of the first state, one must become restrained, the fornication of the mind. But in order to have this leave the second state, one must be resurrected, one must be born again through repentance. Some maintain that a person cannot be freed from desires of the flesh, much less from impure thoughts and emotions, that such a state is unnatural. Now, notice what he said, because Chrysostom talks about this often, and, and, and I think uh, Saint Simeon, the new theologian, talks about this. People say that it is impossible not to have these thoughts. This is what he's addressing here. We should never say this. We have to struggle against these thoughts. And the saints do achieve such a purity that they stop having the thoughts. So for us to say, well, it's impossible just because we find it difficult to avoid having these thoughts does not mean that it's impossible. That's just an excuse to get us off the hook from having to actually control those thoughts. So let's listen again to what St. Ignatius says. Some maintain that a person cannot be freed from the desires of the flesh, much less from impure thoughts and emotions, that such a state is unnatural. God gives the commandment. God knows what is possible and impossible for us better than we do ourselves. And therefore, the attainment of purity, both in body and in heart, is possible for a person. God, the creator of nature, gives the commandment, and therefore, purity of heart is not contrary to human nature. It is unnatural to the fallen nature. It was, unna it was natural to the newly created man. It can become natural again upon our renewal. It can be cultivated and acquired like wheat, vegetables, and fruit-bearing trees. They do not grow on the earth by themselves, but only when the land is prepared in the proper way. Labor is needed. The object of our labor is worth a long and difficult labor. Purity is called holiness in the scriptures. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you should know how to possess his own vessel. He means a body. This is, he's quoting St. Paul here. In sanctification and in honor and not in passions of lust. St. Ignatius bring Chaninov from the book there. It's called The Field. has some beautiful writings. I hope you've, have you given any thought to what you're going to be reading for Great Lent? It's coming up. You should have something that you've decided that you're going to be reading for Great Lent. And now we're going to turn to um, St. Gregory Palamas. And this is from his uh, sermon, on virtues and their opposite passions. So the opposite of the passions is the virtues. What are we trying to do by fasting? We are trying to control the passions, to not simply give in to our self-will. Will we want to eat certain things during Lent? Yes, we will. But we're going to control that choice and choose not to follow that not because that is a goal in itself, not because we get a reward for that, not because even breaking the fast is a sin, but the fast, we have to remember, is a, a tool designed by the church to help us exercise our 
self-control so that we follow the will of God and not our own self-will. Because that's the original sin. The original sin of Adam and Eve was that they did what they wanted to do. They followed the self-will rather than following the will of God. And so we try to reverse that by exercising and by controlling our self-will so that we follow God's will. So here's St. Gregory Palamas from the homily on virtues and their opposite passions. Whoever is a friend of his body is a friend of the world. And he doesn't mean, to mean that in the good sense, okay? To be a friend of the world is not a good sense. When, as a result of this love for the body, we have an excessive desire for worldly pleasures, pursue them and cultivate them, we wrap ourselves in all different kinds of ugliness of the passions. As earthly enjoyment works through the senses, and our senses are many and diverse, sensual pleasures and passions too are of great number and variety. Some act through our sight, others through our hearing, and others through our senses of smell and touch and taste. It is not food that, that is to blame, for these passions are associated with taste, but food to excess, which is self-indulgence. These passions are gluttony, eating delicacies, drinking too much, and drunkenness. When the stomach receives immoderate amounts of food, it passes through the digestive system in great quantities, and by doing so produces abundant fuel for evil's fire. Having received loathsome things, it yields di di disgusting torrents, by means of which the lower passions come into being, fornication, adultery, immorality, licentiousness, bodily impurity in all forms. These passions enslave our hearing, sight, and sense of smell and make us long for what is filthy, foul talk, immoral songs, satanic dances, perfumes which encourage defilement, disgusting cosmetic self-adornment with extravagance. People in the grip of such passions beautify themselves outwardly, but inwardly they wear the ugly mask of dishonorable vices. They really are like the whitened sepulchres, which appear outwardly beautiful, but within are full of stench and all uncleanliness. Once our senses have been subject to evil from within and from without, from far and near, they attract filth, and the deadly sin goes in and out through these natural windows of ours. Those are the things which proceed out of the mouth, it says, they defile a man. This sort of body-loving soul, which pursues pleasurable sensations by every means and gathers material from all over to delight the touch, the taste, and other senses, begets acquisitiveness and love of money, which give rise to theft, extortion, and every form of greed. So do you see how he's drawing the, the desire for to satisfy the senses? This leads to the 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 uh, defilement of the soul at least to other kinds of sins the sins of the soul like greed and, th and things like this so that's why we're trying to control our senses by being more disciplined during great lent in addition to these evils there is another all-embracing means of perception within us apart from the bodily senses imagination which produces other pleasures and passions in those who love the world such as conceit self-esteem and arrogance further complex passions are formed from a mixture of sensual perceptions and imagination these are the desire to please people vanity and pride so did you think the desire to please people is a good thing oh, oh i'm just a, a people pleaser I'm just a people pleaser. Why are you a people pleaser? Because you want people to like you. You want people to speak well of you. That's rooted in pride. Okay, he nailed it. He totally nailed it. So um, I, I have some beautiful words by St. John Chrysostom, but we're basically at our, our the end of our time. So uh, let's just see what he says. We'll just close out with him. Lastly, and 
he's he's again speaking about the fact that we have to control ourselves learn then here's chrysostom what are the things that defile the man let us learn and let us flee from them for even in the church we see such a custom prevailing amongst the generality men giving diligence to come in clean garments to have their hands washed but not to present a clean soul to god they make no account of this and i do not say this as forbidding them to wash their hands or their mouth as necessary but not with water only but with all virtues so then he talks about hey if you had dung on your hands would you come to church no you'd wash your hands so we have to try to purify our souls and thus come to church okay it says what if i have been overtaken by the sins well you're supposed to cleanse yourself how do you do that by weeping by groaning by giving alms and by this way cleansing ourselves okay and he's tell, he encourages his congregation to watch their tongue more than anything else okay and he mentions the fact that people were very very careful about the relations between husbands and wife before coming to church look at that that discipline was something that was expected of marriage partners prior to coming to church okay that they should not enjoy each other's company in the bedroom in that respect prior to coming to church and he says that is not defiling isn't that interesting he says you're taking care of this but marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled okay and yet you're you're doing other things you're dallying with the devil in other ways so they're being careful about these kinds of physical pleasures and not allowing thinking that they should avoid those prior to coming to church but that actually is not something which defiles a person this is what chrysostom is saying here i'm not encouraging you to not observe that self-restraint i'm not saying that at all but what he's trying to say is that the things that we think of as defiling are not necessarily what really defiles us it's what is going on in our hearts and in our heads and that we need to to conquer these um these temptations especially what's happening in our minds as we look at others and we judge others and we we are concerned about our own fasting and by this we become self-righteous etc so these are the final words of saint john chrysostom on this from this homily come with confidence to god and receive not wrath when it comes upon you and if you desire for him to be with you drive away these things like a mad dog do not dishonor your tongue for how will it entreat for you when it has lost its proper confidence adorn it with gentleness and humility make it worthy of god who is entreated fill it with blessing with much almsgiving for it is possible with words to do alms so here when he's talking about the tongue we have a tendency people have a tendency to use foul language this is something which should never happen should never come out of the mouth of a christian or to say bad things about people or to gossip all of these things defile us he says if you want to use your tongue in a way to entreat god and you want him to respond to you then use your tongue for the right things and even if you can't give physical alms use good words and answer people peaceably and with meekness and you will adorn your tongue and you will be following the laws of god so as we draw near to him for deliverance from hell for remission of sins to escape intolerable punishments to attain heavens let's fall down before him in both body and mind that he may raise us up when we are down and let us converse with all gentleness and meekness if you will accuse accuse yourself if you will wet and sharpen your tongue let it be against your own sins and tell not what evil another has done to you but what you have done to yourself for this most truly is an evil since no one else will be able to really readily injure you unless you injure yourself um uh, chrysostom one of his earliest works earliest writings was a treatise called no one can harm the man who does not harm himself and this is his point 
people cannot really hurt us. Even if they kill us, they cannot hurt us because they can't deprive us of eternal life. If somebody says something against you, that cannot hurt us unless we allow it to, unless we respond back to them, unless we wish evil to them, unless we respond with unclean language. This is what he is saying. If you desire to be against those who wronged you, approach as against yourself first. There is no one to hinder this. You can't change the other person, but we can change ourselves. And what injury at all have you really to mention? That the, that such a one insulted you and spoiled you by val violence and encompassed you with dangers? No, this is not receiving an injury. But if we are sober, we would receive the greatest benefit. So he sees these things that other people do to us as a potential for us to become sanctified by the manner in which we respond to them. If you have been spoiled, accuse yourself. If you have been, if you have been affected by another person, pray for him that spoiled you because he has done you the greatest good. For although the intent of the doer was not such, yet you have received the greatest benefit if you endured it nobly. Reflecting on these things, let us flee from this sword. Let us flee from the madness. Nothing is more foolish than the slave of wealth, of anger, and of passions. He thinks he has overcome when he has been overcome. He thinks he is the master when he in fact is a slave. In other words, if we think that we are, if somebody says something to us and we think that by responding to them in an unkind way or with foul language or something like this, we have overcome them. Instead, we have been defeated. This is Chrysostom's point. He thinks he is the master when he's become a slave. He's put bonds upon himself and he rejoices. He is pleased, but although he has become a captive, he prides himself and leaps for joy on seeing a rabid dog and flying at his soul when he ought to bind him and weaken him by hunger. That's where the fasting comes in. He actually supplies him with abundance of food that he may leap upon him more fiercely and more formidably. So notice that he's saying here, we control when we can control our bodily um, appetites, including in areas like food, we become stronger and more able to control our responses to other people. Finally, let's close with this. Reflecting then on all these things, let us loose the bonds, let us slay the monster, let us drive away the disease, cast out the madness, that we may enjoy a clean, calm, and pure health. And having with much pleasure sailed into the serene haven, may attain to the eternal blessings unto which may we all attain by the grace and love towards mankind of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when we meet again next week, it will be the beginning of Great Lent. So I wish you all a good galiarchi, a good beginning to Great Lent. I'll see you next week on Clean Monday also. But let us now close with our prayer. I hope these words were an inspiration to you coming from the fathers of the church, especially St. John Chrysostom, who knows the kinds of temptations that we face. Sometimes we don't think of them as serious temptations, but just somebody speaking to us in a certain way, insulting us, um, say, using bad language toward us. This is a way that we can acquire purity of heart by exercising our self-control in how we respond to them. And then we have become the master and not become a slave to our passions. So now let's close with our prayer. Lord, now let your servants depart in peace according to your word. For our eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to enlighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Amen. Good night.